You know, you missed it. You missed it last night. It was Debbie Zimmerman's special LA, LA at the convention center. It was fabulous. People came down by the car road. They came down from, from the science community, U University of Hawaii. They, they came down from industry. They came down from the hotels and tourism and the HTA. You missed it. I'm sorry for you. And one of the guys who was there was Rocky Calvo. And he is the executive director, I get this right, of the Electrochemical Society, which is a society that is the center of this whole thing last night. Welcome to our show, Rocky. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Great to have you. I, I, didn't, I didn't meet you in person, but I saw you on this huge, big screen, and there you are, <laughs> 10 by 10. That's right. A front man for uh, the, the great city of Honolulu and Hawaii. Yeah. Well, you have a very local style about you. That's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, electrochemistry. When this thing first came up, when uh, Debbie announced it at last year's, uh, you know, Ele Ele meeting, uh, it struck me, I didn't realize that uh, electricity um, and chemistry, they're, they're bonded at the hip. Mm -hmm. you know, one feeds the other. It's the movement of the electrons, and the electrons move in a matter of chemistry. And you're at the center. Tell us what electrochemistry is. Well, you just defined it pretty well. Um, it's um, electrical energy and chemical change and the interaction between those two things. And that leads to a, a lot of uh, very interesting processes. Uh, we're in, um, it's, a, it's a multidisciplinary science, obviously. So you, you see the chemistry piece. The, uh, there's, a, there's a big physics piece, electrical engineering, chem engineering, uh, material science are all part oh, of it. Oh, you're naming a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's good. It means confluence. Uh, it means collaboration. It means different disciplines coming together to find new frontiers they didn't find before. You know? That's right. That's our job. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's fabulous. You must be in a very statement, a state of constant excitement, <laughs> being the executive director of all this. Well, that's right. Uh, those uh, a lot of uh, electrons firing around all the time will do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, how many members you have, and what what do they do around the world? We have nine thousand members, uh, but uh, you know our constituency is is much larger than that uh, because of all the different disciplines. Uh, so some people like to be a card carrying member; others publish with us, come to our meetings, uh, and affiliate maybe more closely with uh, some of the other uh, professional societies that are out there in physics oh, sure. and chemistry. Um, and so. Um, as I said, we have 9,000 members. And they're global. They're everywhere. Everywhere. You find them in every continent yes. in the world? Mostly uh, non-U.S. Uh, oh, interesting. Very heavy concentration in Europe uh, and, and Asia. It's, it's one of the meetings we, uh, reasons we do regular meetings here in, in Hawaii. Yeah, perfect place. Perfect yeah. place. Yeah. So um, uh, are, there's a lot of activity here, and, and I just wonder if you could give us a, a handle on what the areas of research mm -hmm. are yeah. that are at the frontier that we right. should all be excited about. Well, so the, the, the area now that we're, uh, which is most active, uh, which in, in our case usually means most well-funded uh, in the research <laughs> community, <laughs> <laughs> of, is um, uh, energy conversion and storage, right? So we have uh, people uh, certainly commercially successful doing research on, uh, in batteries. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we just celebrated the, the, the 25th anniversary of the lithium-ion battery. No kidding. The event was seen that yeah, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, commercially. Uh, uh, when it first came out, and now it's we're all carrying it in our pocket in our phones. Uh, and yeah, so, even when they explode. You know, yeah, well, that's that. only the Samsung version. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. They're trying to make them smaller and more powerful and longer lasting, and yeah. there's a threshold that they've crossed. Uh, yeah. So they need to find maybe a new material uh, to make it work better. Well, let's talk about graphene. I mentioned it to you before the show because I'm fascinated with graphene. Mm -hmm. It's that one carbon atom thick um, membrane, so to speak, and it holds a charge. Mm -hmm. this, this has tremendous prospect way beyond lithium ion, yeah? Right, right. Uh, I mean, a new material like that, uh, you know, what, what my understanding of it is uh, all kinds of applications. Uh, it's been likened to silicon. And uh, so there's a, there's a huge upside potential in all of the different kinds of fields. Yeah, I've always said, you know, I mean, I'm seriously now, for the past five years anyway, I've always said, that the guy who figures out storage, and that means electricity storage, is going to make Bill Gates look like a piker. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be so rich. Well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's happening on your watch. You see those researchers out there working on that very issue, trying to make that. Yeah, happen. it's been, you know, for me, um, I've been with the organization a long time. <laughs> and um, and uh, some of the things that are happening now uh, in, in renewable energy uh, in other places, uh, 
should mention water sanitation. Um, it's, it's just a very special time period for the importance of the science that, uh, in an area that I've been working a long time. I, and, and I, I mentioned the water, too, because we, we were recently funded by the Gates Foundation. Oh, okay, there's a free association here. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they, so we, we involved one of their program directors in a symposium, which is what we did. We, we ran a symposium on, on a topic related to uh, water hygiene, um, uh, specifically uh, human waste. Uh, because there's electrochemical processes that can mm -hmm. really help with that. And they tapped us on the shoulder and said, the symposium was great, but help us find some people that can solve these problems. And so they, they funded a, a program that basically uh, was, was designed to help them find solutions to the human waste, you know, create the electrochemical toilet, which actually exists. There's a group at Caltech that won an award for the electrochemical toilet. It's a fascinating is, thing. Is it physical or chemical? or how does it, just, just in a word, how does it work? Well, so... It, uh, I mean, there's a lot of different solutions. Sure. Uh, uh, the one that was most interesting to me, I'll give you an example of one, was uh, a group. Uh, so they, they funded five uh, different groups. Uh, we, the, the Gates Foundation is very interesting the way they operate, very direct, very focused. Uh, they came to one of our meetings. They said, we want to do a workshop. We got some problems. We're going to show them to these folks. We're going to have them give us a short summary of what their solution is, then we're going to bring them into the shark tank <laughs> and see who's got one. And that's exactly what we did. You know, yeah, yeah, about three or four days, you know, they had to look at the problem, come up with a solution, and, and sell that to uh, our, our panel. Yeah, it was a very, very uncommon thing to do at a professional meeting like ours. Uh, but we had the money and the Gates name behind it, and it worked very well. And anyway, uh, they, they funded five groups. Uh, and. All of them came up with something very interesting, and, and uh, the one example that, uh, that I'll give you is we have a lot of people working on fuel cells. And so they basically created a fuel cell to uh, take the human waste uh, uh, with two uh, uh, byproducts, uh, basically gray water mm -hmm. and, and then a power source that you can create from, from the waste. And that's it. No waterless plumbing necessary. Wow. Now, you well, can't take that to the masses. Level, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, Gates, uh, I, I'm inspired by what they do, they, they, they brought up a few of us to their headquarters and said, this is how we want to run this program, and this is why. 2.5 billion people around the world do not have sanitary conditions uh, right. to, for, for This uh, will save their lives. Yeah, it's, it's life-changing. Yeah. And then here are our folks, uh, they, they have solutions. And as I said, it's hard to take that technology to the masses, but it's there, it's, it's incredible. And it's great to have foundations like Gates, you know, pushing uh, on that direction. Well, you know, Rocky, I've always felt, at least the past 10, 20 years, since, since Bill Gates did the Internet, actually, that science was accelerated by the ability to collaborate, and that means collaborate on the web. You know, before that, there were various efforts in the scientific community to, to collaborate, but it was slow, it was sluggish, it was hard, you know, and you couldn't find things. Mm -hmm. Now, with Google and, you know, and the web, you can find things. And if you, if you publish something on the web, you can immediately have feedback resonance, collaboration anywhere in the world. It's, it's unbelievable the right. time we live in. And the greatest beneficiary of that is science, where you move it ahead at the frontier, pushing at the frontier. So this has changed things. I mean, it, it seems to me that um, science moves faster now than it ever did before in our lifetime in, in the world. Um, and the question is, you know, how can we make it move yet faster? Right. And one of the points that we've talked about before the show is um, you, need, you need to publish if you're in science, just like in any other academic, uh, you know, pursuit. Um, and the question is whether the publishing process facilitates, appropriately mm -hmm. facilitates the science. You want to talk about that? Sure. Well, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, the greatest opportunity we've ever had to really just satisfy our mission. Uh, mission is very similar, simple. Uh, disseminate research to advance the science. And we've always done that, uh, very focused on, on, on how we do it and, and why is uh, through, through our publications and on our meetings, which is a, a personal decision. Sure, sure. Well, that's another way to facilitate communication, isn't right. it? Right. And so uh, all of a sudden, as you described, uh, uh, the, the, the digital revolution takes over and, and then you, you have Google and, and everything becomes incredibly discoverable. Yeah. And we can disseminate research better than we ever have, yeah. except th the model that's been set up to do, do it is essentially broken. It doesn't really facilitate taking advantage of the new technologies. And, and, and the reason is because um, dissemination of the highest end research, the peer review uh, stuff that, get, that gets in all the uh, elite journals, all the journals, period, uh, is, um, is, is 
uh, redistribute it to a subscription model. And that, that's the piece that's broken because the subscription model requires the scientist to submit to a journal, get accepted, and then published. And, and once, once that uh, publication is available, it's, it's part of uh, a subscription, which are very, very expensive. And that breaks down the system because now people who can't afford it, and it's, be, it's worse and worse, uh, can't have access to very important research in medical, at science, uh, at engineering disciplines, at world-changing, life-changing disciplines. Uh, Why don't they just uh, you know, spend the money? <laughs> because they, they don't have it. And the prices are getting higher and higher. They, there's, uh, there's a commercial element that's also evolved. Uh, so the, the, the majority of science publishing and medical publishing is really done through uh, a, a handful of small mm -hmm. commercial publishers that dominate the market and, and basically set the pricing. Uh, and so only very you know, high-end universities can afford a lot of these subscriptions, and which means only the people at their universities have access to it. What I get is it stands in the way, and I'll give you my own professional experience. I'm, I'm an attorney by training and, mm -hmm. and by, I hate to say, 50 years of practice. But um, you know, in the beginning, there were these, uh, it was early on, and it was uh, sort of sluggish, but you could do research online, mm -hmm. okay? And there were two or three publishing houses that would sell you subscriptions, mm -hmm. and they were breathtakingly expensive. And all you're looking for is, you know, the statutes in your state, mm -hmm. federal statutes, you're looking for cases hither and yon, you want to have precedent, whatnot, okay? And it was really expensive, still is if you use these subscriptions, very expensive to get this information so you could write your brief or do your research, okay? Um, come the internet. Uh, see, it's, it's different with the law and the science, I think. Um, I'm interested in exploring that difference with you. Um, so come the internet. Now you want to find a case, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. You go on Google, you see the news, you see the scientific, rather uh, legal community is talking about a case. You can get the, the, the citation pretty easily. Nobody cares if you published in a fancy journal or not. Nobody cares where you got it. You got it, and you got the citation, and it's verifiable. So all of a sudden, the business of legal research has changed dramatically. The field has been leveled. It has been democratized. Mm -hmm. Even the one lawyer shop now can get this legal research at free or cheap. And uh, that, you know, that has been a remarkable change. There are other changes mm -hmm. in, in legal practice also, but that one is notable. So when I, come, when I come to you and you tell me about these expensive journals that everybody has all this respect for, I say, as a guy who has been in a democratized area of practice, I say, well, you know, let them take a walk. Um, because you can put it on the web and who cares where it came from, who cares where it published. Mm -hmm. There's going to be entrepreneurs out there mm -hmm. who will develop credibility in the same fashion that these you know, older model publishing companies have done. And they will, see if you agree, they will ultimately rule the field, don't you think? And that's why we're calling this show Free the Science right here on ThinkTech Energy. <laughs> well, we hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that's, that, that's the strategy. It's... it's it's not that easy in science. There, there's some obstacles because the community, uh, you know, the, the high end, the accomplished scientists, uh, well, not, not just them, but the, the accomplished scientists have grown up in a system where they've provided their research to these publishers uh, who've sold it through the subscription model. And, and to get them uh, to change and, and understand the importance of democratizing uh, the science so that others can have it is, is an obstacle. And, you know, it, which, which is why we've gone on all the way out in a limb and with this whole idea of, of free to science, this mantra. So people understand at a, at a deeper level that uh, it, it, it's not that way. And there's a lot of uh, people that are excluded from this conversation. And that is stifling the importance or the advancement of important science in the renewable energies or in benefit the world cancer treatment. And humanity right. in general. Right. Okay, now we've been talking to uh, Rocky Calvo. He's the executive director of the Electrochemical Society, which plays a big role in energy. And we'll take a short break. When we come back, we're going to find out whether this is limited to matters of electrochemical research or whether it's in all research and all countries, and whether it affects the global process of scientific research. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Dean Nelson, host of Planet of the Courageous. From a Tibetan point of view, we chose to be on this planet because we enrolled in a sort of graduate school for courage. Just that we may have chosen this adventure is a leap of logic. The question is, how do we spend and make sense of this precious human life? 
we are as a species extraordinarily successful, dominating the planet, and now with planetary science problems that our existence itself has created. It takes courage to face not only the uncertainty of life, but also the challenge of sustaining the gift of life for future generations. Join us every other Monday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. <laughs> We're here with Rocky Calvo. He is the executive director of the Electric Chemical Society, which was just feted uh, yesterday, last night at the convention center at the, what is it, uh, the LA, LA meeting that was run by Debbie Zimmerman with 500 people in attendance. It was quite something. There you were on the screen. I remember that well. <laughs> I love that meeting. I love the show. So, um, it's not limited to electrochemical research, is it? No, it's not. And, you know, the, the groundswell of support that started changing the game, actually, uh, it was started really through uh, government, government initiatives in the U.S., Japan, and England were some of the starters. And um, I want to say, oh, half a dozen years ago, I can't remember exactly, uh, there was uh, some mandates that were uh, put in place uh, to get us this point. And they, they were basically saying government research is not going to be sold this way. Mm. And we're going to start, the, the mandates are going to start having uh, effect on all the different agencies. Uh, and, and this year is actually, they take place where... 2017? 2017, in October of this year, the, the scientists uh, that are being funded by uh, most of uh, the agencies in the United States, will, it, their research will be required to be published in journals that provide open access to the research. And so uh, that, that got the ball rolling. The open access means free. Free, right, open access. So, so we, uh, as a, uh, a publisher of, of our science, uh, we, we initiated this Free to Science campaign, and one of the first things we did was we created this open access option for our authors to, to start well, that's to... that's a great yeah, idea. Yeah. It, so here's the problem. <laughs> so we're doing it in our, in our mainstream journals. Uh, but and so about forty to fifty percent of our current submissions are coming from authors are open access, but uh, we'll, we'll ultimately run into a problem with our subscribers because we still require the subscription revenue, and our subscribers are going to say, "Well, you're giving half of it away for free." Yeah. So eventually, there may be some questions about that. But but our, but our subscribing institutions are very much in favor of this whole movement as well, and the movement has taken on uh, partners uh, some. Uh, major foundations have funded an organization that we're partnering with called the Center for Open Science, mm -hmm. uh, who is uh, eventually going to provide for us the platform for this discoverability and dissemination. So w right now we have to pay a third party vendor to, to provide that for us. So um, there's an organization out there called Research for Life, who we've also partnered with. You, you mentioned the democratizing this, right? Yes. They exist to do that because they have uh, foundation funding that says, you know, we're going to find these institutions that can't afford the subscriptions and we're going to help them get them. So, sure. so we're, you know, by help, they're going to either uh, pay for them or cut a deal with the, the publisher or whatever. In, in our case, there's 121 universities now that we hadn't been able to reach before that we're simply saying, here, here's our library. You can have our entire library. Oh, that's library. great. That's great. Um, of course, you, you want it to be across the board, ideally, <clears throat> rather than on a selected basis or, um, you know, a need to know, a need to have basis where there's a subjective uh, judgment being made on whether this uh, individual university or organization Correct. needs it. That's right. Uh, you'd like to have everybody to That's have right. It. But let me ask you, um, you know, a contrary question for a minute, Rocky, and that is this. <clears throat> you know, we have seen in that 20 years of the, of the Internet, we have seen all kinds of garbage on the internet where you don't know if it's true or not and you know and our friend uh, Mr. Trump you know has capitalized on that by you know classifying things as fake right. um, and um, uh, you know if you're talking about science you have a lot of people in the science community that want to have peer review that want to be sure that their peers and everybody's peers have looked at this and can you know validate that yes it's good science it's good process mm -hmm. uh, these are serious people they're not just fooling us now, if you, if you take away the peer review or if you take away the money aspect here, arguably, and you, I want you to argue with me, <laughs> <laughs> arguably, you know, you're removing that, that kind of uh, that validation process uh, that where you can feel comfortable as to what's coming down the pike. Right. Yeah, so I, I will argue with you, although I think you're making a good point. Uh, you know, ultimately, I, I don't know where it goes, uh, but having uh, been part of the system and watching how it wor works, I think for us as a nonprofit publisher, the peer review important uh, process is still important for, yeah. for our, our constituents because we, we're providing that filter that's saying 
you know, when you see our brand and our name, it's through our journal, then, uh, then you can have confidence that uh, other scientists have looked at it. In fact... So you're providing, you're, you're, you're providing both, peer review and hopefully are. democratization. We are. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, the issue is that peer review is, is slower and is an expensive process, yeah. uh, still is. And whether ultimately uh, this is something that, uh, you know, the, the market won't need eventually is, is I think, still in debate. I, I, don't, I don't know where it goes. Yeah. No, and that on uh, and every other validation that we find on the internet. Well, we don't know where it's going to go. Yeah. But I mean, can, can you, for example, turn around to the peers mm -hmm. who review this and say, look, you know, we know you like to be paid, but can we pay you a little less this time? Can you do this as a matter of contribution, mm -hmm. volunteer contribution, or mm -hmm. partial volunteer contribution mm -hmm. to the common good of science, free to science? Can, mm -hmm. Would that work? Uh, it, it does. Ah, good. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an editorial board of very committed, uh, very underpaid editors, and some of them have already made that commitment that you just described. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm very impressed, and I think that uh, it sounds to me that you're at the head of the game on this, mm -hmm. that what you're doing in electrochemical uh, industry uh, is something that could be picked up by other such research organizations around the country and the world, and it's, it's a movement that, in my view, is irresistible. If you care about science, you'd want to do this. You'd want to you'd change things so that it's more easily available. Um, and that means we're, we're in a movement that is probably gathering speed. Do you have indication, do you have indicators that suggest to you that it is gathering speed? Oh, there's no question. Uh, the, the model's changing. I mean, we've taken a, a fairly extreme position uh, because we just felt uh, it, was, it was our best option. Um, it, it, almost as if, if we can't do it this way, uh, not publishing in, in this peer review uh, system that exists is m maybe, uh, you know, something we can't do anymore. Yeah. Uh, but um, there's, there's all kinds of uh, different intermediate steps. Uh, and you know another one that's had a lot of success, who is also uh, a partner f uh, with us uh, from the standpoint their publisher is on our advisory board for this whole initiative, is the Public Library of Science. Right? They started with a, uh, a grant, a significant one, from the, the Gordon Moore Foundation. Gordon Moore is a famous member of the Electrochemical Society. All right, okay, all right. <laughs> I hope you're writing this down. This is going to be on the final exam. Coming soon. And he lives in Hawaii, just, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, he, he seated them, uh, his foundation seated them with some money around 2004 to publish an open access uh, journal, uh, which is uh, of all the scientific disciplines, uh, the public library science. And now, now they are the largest publisher of open access uh, publications, uh, journals in the world. And, um, and it's a very, very successful model for them. Now, they sustain it by uh, charging what they call author processing charges, which means the author has to pay them a certain fee to make this happen. So sounds fair to me. He wants to be published. Right, right. It's, and it, it takes the control, the subscription control, pricing control of, of the, the big publishers out of the formula. And as you said, it allows the author to independently make that decision. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, we do some of that. We, we still think that that that's creates a certain hardship uh, you know, for the author to charge uh, APCs, author pay charge. So we're, we're, try we're trying to get to a model where it's both completely free to both the author and the end user. Well, you know, I, I worry a little because uh, this is um, at, at the front end, it's a frontier kind of thing, and hopefully it's gaining momentum, but, you know, boards of organizations like the um, Electrochemical Society may change, executives will change over time, other boards may come in, and other people, you know, may, be, may have a different view of things going forward, and these big publishers are probably working hard to undermine or at least mm -hmm. mod modify what you're doing so that they can stay in business oh, as sure. public companies. I mean, are you worried about the future? Is this the kind of thing where you have to keep on working on it, keep on advocating for it, talk to other organizations, talk to the scientific community? Mm -hmm. Don't forget how important it is. Uh, absolutely. It's why I'm sitting here talking to you. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, change my job, too. I, uh, I, you know, I, I, I came through the system, the old system, and, and here I am, and, and we're trying to do this. And I just, I have a great belief that the, the scientific and medical communities, the, the authors, will recognize the value of it. And, and somehow, despite the, the risks and the obstacles, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to succeed. Well, maybe this reflects a, a kind of, the popularity of it reflects a kind of new 
a new dimension, a new attitude about science in general. I, I, you know, I suspect that before, when it was ruled by these big publishing houses, uh, it was more important to the scientist to get his name on the on the front cover of the journal, mm -hmm. and uh, that was a big deal. And yeah. he, it was going to be for his career, his big right. name, his fame, and all that. But now maybe a new generation is coming in. A new generation says, you know, I'm not. I'm I'm concerned about the science in general. Right. I don't have to be rewarded big time. I don't have to be famous. And all I want to do is make a good contribution, you know, to world science. And maybe you have more people like that now. Well, I think absolutely because ne they, they they can see the opportunity. You know, it's working hand in hand. I think that that's always been the case with scientists. You know, they they. Do what they do to make the world a better place. Yes, uh, you know, I, agree, I, yes. I know so many of them. It's, yeah. it's, in the end, that's what they're trying they're to do. People, aren't right? They? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's why I've worked for them for so long. I, I have so much respect for that. And and you see, uh, the, the transitions. I mentioned one. I, I wanted to just another story, just to show you how things are, are changing. There's a twist on things. Uh, there's a, a woman scientist in Kazakhstan, of all places, right? And she's so adamant that what's happening with these uh, these subscriptions behind paywalls is so wrong they went and they stole uh, one of the major publishers uh, body of knowledge <laughs> wow right wow. Uh, it was some staggering number of articles that they've made available on a on a website you can look up it called sci-hub right <laughs> and it's a banded website they, they they use the word pirate on the you know right on the sci-hub pirate website you know for scientists <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing about it is they have download information. They can see it. They can show who's using it. And a staggering number of scientists, and not just from underdeveloped world, from the United States, from e people are saying, yeah, this science should be free, and if somebody can make it available to us that way, stolen or otherwise, because it's not ethically correct. I, you know, I can't sit here, and, and I, I certainly don't want to say I support that necessarily, but that's the kind of thing that's happening out there. That's it, and that's the demand of it, and that's the scientific community the, responding. And, and the people who are listed there, they're, they're proud to be involved, I think. <laughs> well, they understand that, you know, maybe what they're doing isn't exactly right, but the way the system's set up isn't exactly right either. Yes. Now, question, and this is the, the, my last question for you for the show, is what about the federal government? Federal government has supported and, and allowed these big publishers to create this, uh, you know, this monopoly they have uh, on, on, on some aspects of the scientific publishing market. But um, can't the federal government change all this? Uh, can't, uh, you know, an enlightened um, uh, official, uh, a president, uh, a Congress fix all this in one stroke? Well, I, I think... You can talk to them. They're right there. <laughs> so, uh, check the red light. Tell them what you think they ought to do. I, th I don't think you can do it in one stroke. I, I understand that. But um, the, the federal government has already put in these mandates. I, I mentioned them before. They, they can insist that research that a federal, uh, any government is funding should be available to the public. Uh, that's, that's the right thing to do. And, and, and again, uh, governments have taken those steps already. <laughs> Thank you, Rocky. You're welcome. Rocky Calvo, so nice to talk to you. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs>